Hello and welcome to the webinar. We're getting started a little bit early today to set up our live stream. So thank you for your patience as we get everything all set up for the talk today. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be getting started in just a few minutes. Um, in the meantime, I'd love to tell you about some upcoming events that we have going on at the center. Um, so we are actually working on creating a health-centered agriculture education program. Um, so in this effort, we would love any and all feedback um, on what is most interesting about a health-centered agriculture program. Um, for those uh, who are familiar with the space there, it is a very broad, <laughs> broad space. There's many different directions we could go. Uh, so we're soliciting some learner feedback. Um, we are offering a chance to win a $25 gift certificate to the Ecology Center store um, for those who complete the survey before November 15th. And I'll put that link in the chat for the people who are attending our Zoom version of the presentation today. And um, we ask that you don't necessarily complete it right now. We want you to be able to be present during the webinar today, but I did just want to uh, make that announcement for everyone that that is uh, something we're looking for feedback on. Um, CUEH is also has some upcoming other webinars on uh, next Tuesday, November 9th, we have elevator ventilation and SARS-CoV-2 particulate matter removal in partnership with Michael Cotto, MPH, he's one of the PhD students here at uh, Berkeley. On Wednesday, November 17th, we have the effects of chronic heat stress and shift work on postural stability in firefighters, and that is a pilot study in partnership with Rachel Zeller, PhD candidate and the University of Cincinnati Education and Research Center. Um, and due to very high demand, our first offering sold out in two days. <laughs> We've added some new courses and new course dates for our assessing ventilation for COVID-19 mitigation class. So it's a hybrid online and in-person hands-on course where learners will get hands-on experience using bolometers to collect and analyze ventilation data with David Moore, CIH. The next offering for this class will be December 13th through 14th, 2021. We are also offering an OSHA 10 construction course on December 7th through 10th, 2021. This is also a hybrid class on Zoom and in person and will instill safety awareness with an emphasis on hazard identification, avoidance, control, and prevention. For more, you can visit us online at cueh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE to learn more about these events and other things that we have going on at the center. And without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, I see we already have 226 people logged into the webinar today. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that screen. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate your time today. Um, and on behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I'd like to welcome you to today's topic, Health Effects of Cell Phone and Cell Tower Radiation, Implications for 5G. Thank you for being here. A few housekeeping items for the webinar today, you'll be muted during the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. And we ask that you use the Q&A box versus the chat as it's easier for us to keep track of the questions in the Q&A box. We'll also save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. We do have a lot of learners here today, so we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page. And all participants who, lie, who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today via Zoom will receive an email tomorrow with an evaluation and a link to get your certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. 
And once the evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our presenter for today, Joel Moskowitz, PhD. He has directed the Center for Family and Community Health, the School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley since 1993, and has published research on disease prevention for 40 years. In 2009, he served as the senior author on a hallmark paper reviewing research on mobile phone use and tumor risk published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Last year, he updated this meta-analysis in a paper published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. This year, he co-authored a paper on electrohypersensitivity published in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. Since 2013, he has translated and disseminated research on the biologic and health effects of wireless radiation through his website. That's safe, saferemr.com. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we're, we're very excited for your presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Um, can you hear me? Good, okay. Uh, and thanks, uh, my thanks to the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health for uh, inviting me to do this presentation today. I'd also like to thank the roughly a thousand people who have registered for this webinar, which I think attests to the worldwide concern about this environmental pollutant or toxin. Uh, we have virtually every state represented here today and about 40 nations, uh, at least those who have registered. Over the past two decades, let me share my slides now. Do you have my slide, my first slide? Nope, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen again, that would be great. Okay. Try that again. Do we have it now? Yes, we do. You're all set. Great. Over the past two decades, we've been exposed to increasing amounts of radio frequency or wireless radiation from cell phones and cell towers, computers, laptops, and tablets, Wi-Fi routers, smart thermostats, televisions, and other household appliances, including baby monitors, smart utility meters, and security systems, and even from motor vehicles. For many people, the greatest source of exposure is their cell phone due to the proximity to their bodies 24-7. Although my focus today is on the tumor risk from wireless radiation, I will briefly discuss other health effects that occur far more frequently. See my website, saferemr.com, for information about all the biologic and health research. Let me begin with some background about cellular technology. My slides are not advancing for some reason. Could you try um, clicking on the presentation again, and then uh, maybe it just needs a reminder. <laughs> ah, there you go. All right. We good now? Uh, yes, we see your second slide. So how does cellular technology work? Countries are divided into small geographic areas called cells. Each cell is serviced by a cell tower or base station which transmits and receives microwaves to and from cell phones in the cell. Cell phone users connect to the nearest tower using microwaves to make a call, text, or download data. The tower is connected either wirelessly or via cable or optical fiber to a switching station that connects the user to a person or to a server that houses a, a website. Some radiation produced by the phone is absorbed in the head and body of the user. A smaller amount emitted by the cell tower is also absorbed. However, the tower exposes everyone in the cell to some wireless radiation on a 24-7 basis. Cell phones have evolved since 1984 from heavy transportable devices with external antennas to compact multifunction devices with internal antennas. In the early models, the antennas that transmitted microwave radiation were at the top of the phone. However, with smartphones, the antennas may be located at the bottom of the phone 
thus the most intense exposure to radiation for a user who holds her smartphone near her ear may now be in her neck, not her head. This may have implications for where to look now for cell phone related tumors. In addition to changes in the physical design of the phone, the network technology has evolved from the first generation called 1G to the fifth generation or 5G. The base stations include macro towers that are 100 to 400 feet tall that may have a range of many miles and small cells up to 50 feet tall that typically have a range from 10 to a few hundred yards. Small cell antennas may be located on streetlights or utility poles just a few yards from people's residences. The proximity of these antennas to where people live has raised safety concerns among the general public and has led to worldwide grassroots activism. One of the many petitions to stop deployment of 5G has been signed by over 300,000 people. The electromagnetic spectrum includes all types of electromagnetic fields arrayed by the frequency or length of the waves. On the far right are the highest frequency and smallest waves, which are considered ionizing, for example, X-rays. This radiation has sufficient energy to knock electrons out of their orbits, causing an atom to become charged or ionized, which can directly cause chemical changes and DNA damage. Ionizing radiation has been considered carcinogenic or cancer producing since the 1930s. On the far left are extremely low frequency waves that oscillate up to 3000 cycles per second known as Hertz. These waves can produce strong magnetic fields. Radio waves occur at higher frequencies and the highest frequency radio waves are called microwaves. Cell phones and cordless phones are two way radios that transmit microwaves. Cell phones can emit up to two watts of power. In contrast, a microwave oven can emit a thousand watts, whereas an oven has sufficient power to significantly heat tissue, wireless phones do not, except perhaps when held directly next to the body. Along with cell towers, wireless devices emit microwaves that are modulated and pulsed to encode voice and data. Also, the systems that power these devices emit low frequency electromagnetic fields called EMF, which has been considered quote unquote, possibly carcinogenic since 2001. A smartphone typically has four or five different types of microwave transmitters, including two or three different cellular technologies, along with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Some transmitters operate at multiple frequencies, and some can operate simultaneously with others, exposing users to a complex mixture of radiation. The CTIA is a trade association representing the telecom industry in the US. This group lobbies at the federal, state, and local levels. It engages in legal battles to protect the industry's interests and meets with the FCC about 500 times a year, according to its spokesperson several years ago. In 2020, the telecom industry spent $108 million on lobbying at the federal level, about as much as the oil and gas industry, but four times as much as the tobacco industry. Since the 1980s, we have seen rapid adoption of cell phones and wireless devices that rely on cellular networks. By 2017, the CTIA estimated there were more than 400 million subscriber connections in the US. If the federal government were to collect two cents a month for each of these connections, it could establish a $100 million annual fund to provide for independent research, training, and education regarding wireless radiation health risks. Although the first smartphone was released in 1994, widespread adoption of smartphones began in 2007 with the release of the first iPhone. By 2017, the US had 273 million smartphones in use. As cell phones grew in popularity, American households abandoned traditional landline phones. By 2020, more than 60% of households relied solely on cell phones 
for telecommunications. Due to these developments, the majority of American children under the age of 12 are smartphone users, including about half of children age two or younger. In 1996, when the FCC's exposure limits were adopted, few people anticipated that children would someday use cell phones. From 1995 to 2019, about 400,000 base stations or cell antenna sites were installed in the US. The CTIA estimates the country will need an additional 800,000 cell antenna sites by 2024 for the rollout of 5G. Wireless radiation is regulated by most governments. In 1996, the Federal Communications Commission or FCC adopted guidelines that limit the intensity of exposure to radio frequency radiation. These limits, which were recently reaffirmed by the FCC, were designed to prevent significant heating of tissue from short-term exposure to wireless radiation, so-called thermal effects. This year, in response to a lawsuit, Environmental Health Trust et al. versus FCC, filed by a coalition of health groups and wireless safety advocates, not, not all the groups that are listed in this slide, the DC Federal Appeals Court ruled that before these 1996 exposure limits can be reaffirmed or reestablished, the FCC must carefully consider all of the evidence that was submitted to the agency to ensure that the limits are adequate to protect human health. Many countries have adopted exposure limits similar to the US. In fact, the World Health Organization has promoted limits based upon recommendations of ICNRP, the International Commission on non-ionizing radiation protection. ICNRP is a self-selected group of mostly physical scientists, many of whom depend on industry for the bulk of their research funding, and has been accused by one of its former members, who is one of the most notable EMF scientists in the world, of groupthink. The limits were not designed to protect us from the effects of long-term long exposure to low-intensity radiofrequency radiation. The crux of the health and safety problem we face today was stated by the FDA in 1999. The FCC regulations are, quote, based on protection from acute injury from thermal effects of radio frequency radiation exposure and may not be protected, protective against any non-thermal effects of chronic exposure. Now let's look at the biologic and health effects research. The most consistent evidence from the case control studies of tumor risk finds that heavy long-term cell phone use is associated with increased risk of two brain tumors, glioma, a malignant tumor in the glial cells, and acoustic neuroma, or vestibular schwannoma, a non-malignant tumor of the Schwann cells on the main nerve from the ear to the brain. You can see in these slides the location of these two types of tumors in the rat. Dr. Henry Lai, professor emeritus at the University of Washington and former editor of the journal Electromagnetic Biology and Medicine, has compiled research summaries on the biologic effects of EMF exposure since 1990. He has found that the preponderance of evidence published in peer-reviewed journals indicates that wireless radiation is harmful. In three-fourths of 944 biological studies, wireless radiation produced significant effects, including oxidative stress and free radical generation, genetic effects, including DNA damage, and neurological disorders. In 2015, Igor Young Yakimenko published a review of 100 studies of low intensity exposure to wireless radiation. These studies did not produce thermal effects. The exposures in these studies did not induce significant heating, yet fully 93 of the 100 studies found significant evidence of oxidative stress. The harmful effects included disrupted cell signaling, stress proteins, free radical formation, and DNA damage. 
These effects increase the risk of cancer and neurologic disorders. Those who dismiss these studies of biological effects, such as members of the ICNIRP or ICNIRP, mostly physicists and engineers, have argued there is no possible mechanism for wireless radiation to harm organisms other than heating or thermal effects. They dismiss the many studies that shed light on the mechanisms responsible for the adverse effects from low intensity exposures. Martin Paul has published several review papers. He presents evidence that electromagnetic fields stimulate voltage gated calcium channels to increase calcium ions within the cells, leading to nitric oxide synthesis and creation of superoxides. In one paper, he cited 23 studies which found that calcium channel blockers can eliminate the harmful effects of EMF exposure. 15 studies have found that very low intensity exposure to microwave radiation can open the blood brain barrier, enabling chemical toxins in the circulatory system to penetrate brain tissue. Other mechanisms include effects on potassium and sodium channels. Also certain frequency waves disrupt the cell membrane. In the late 1990s, the Congress cut off the Environmental Protection Agency's funding for research on cell phone radiation. And the National Institutes of Health has funded little research with one exception. The $30 million cell phone radiation studies conducted by the National Toxicology Program or NTP. The studies completed in 2018 were originally called for by the FDA in 1999. The research found that two years of exposure to cell phone radiation yielded, quote unquote, clear evidence in male rats of increased cancer of the heart, heart schwannoma, and some evidence of increased brain and adrenal gland tumors. The results were quote unquote equivocal regarding increased tumor incidence observed in female rats and male and female mice. The NTP pointed out the results can't be directly applied to humans as the amount of exposure was greater than the typical cell phone user receives. Also, these were full body exposures rather than the partial body exposure one primarily receives from a cell phone. Most importantly, this randomized controlled trial proves that cell phone radiation can cause cancer in an animal model without significantly heating tissue. So it proves the non-thermal effects exist. This means the FCC should strengthen its exposure limits, which were designed to protect us only from heating effects. The NTP study also found DNA damage in the brains of mice and rats of both sexes, increased degeneration in the hearts of male and female rats, and decreased birth weight in rats exposed prenatally. The overall likelihood of cancer in male rats was greatest in the middle exposure group, not the highest exposure group. Even the lowest exposure group displayed greater incidence of non-malignant tumors compared to the sham control group. The NTP results regarding heart schwannoma and glioma were confirmed in a large study of male rats conducted by the Ramazzini Institute in Italy using much lower intensity exposures than the NTP study. By the way, the NTP study was not the first to find increased tumor risk caused by microwave radiation. A US Air Force study found that 18% of 100 male rats exposed to low intensity microwave radiation developed tumors as compared to only 5% of 100 rats in the control group, a significant difference. In spite of this evidence, the FDA has refused to conduct a formal risk assessment by dismissing the NTP's research, which worldwide is considered the gold standard of toxicology testing. In 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the IARC, convened 31 scientists from 14 nations to review the research on radiofrequency radiation and cancer. Based upon their review of the science, these experts classified radiofrequency radiation as, quote, possibly carcinogenic to humans, unquote, noting among cell phone users an increased risk of the most common brain cancer, glioma, 
and increased risk of a non-malignant brain tumor, acoustic neuroma. Since 2011, hundreds of studies have found harmful biologic effects, including DNA damage and cancer in animal models and, and also in humans. In 2019, the IARC convened an advisory group of 29 scientists from 18 countries to prioritize agents to be re-reviewed or to be reviewed. These scientists recommended that radiofrequency radiation be re-reviewed by 2024. Many scientists believe that the IARC will reclassify this environmental toxin or pollutant as, quote, probably carcinogenic, unquote, or carcinogenic to humans, quote, unquote. Last year, my colleagues and I published a review of the research that examined the association between cell phone use and tumor risk. This study updated our 2009 review. The results were similar, but based on twice as many studies. The bottom line from eight studies with long-term heavy cell phone use is that 1,000 or more hours of call time on a cell phone was associated with a 60% increased risk of tumors, which amounts to a on average about 17 minutes per day over a 10 year period. Industry funded scientists have dismissed the case control research arguing there is no evidence of increased brain tumor incidence in cancer registries. However, in seven Northern European countries, brain tumor incidence has indeed increased in recent years. Brain tumor incidence has also increased in Australia and New Zealand for those 70 years of age and older. In five countries, glioblastoma, the most serious form of glioma, has increased. This suggests that cell phone use can promote the growth of tumors as well as initiate them. In England, even though glio glioma incidence was stable, the incidence of glioblastoma doubled in recent years. In Sweden, many tumors reported in the inpatient registry were never reported to the tumor registry. The incidence of these tumors doubled over time. In the US, few studies have been done to drill down whether there have been increases in certain types of brain tumors or in specific subgroups. Although glioma incidence has been stable overall in adults, there is evidence of increases in glioblastoma in specific anatomic sites of the brain. Also, there have been disturbing increases in brain tumor incidence among children and young adults. More research is warranted, but our government is not conducting it. A young child's brain absorbs twice the radiation from a cell phone as compared to an adult's brain. Testing procedures used by many governments, including the US, to certify cell phones for sale do not account for this difference in exposure to wireless radiation. Two case control studies have examined cell phone use and brain tumor risk in children. The Cephalo study found an elevated but non-significant increased risk for regular cell phone users, but this was defined as using a cell phone once a week over a six month period. However, the study also found a significant doubling of brain tumor risk among a subgroup of children who used cell phones for 2.8 or more years. And this finding was buried in, this, in the paper. The second study, Moby Kids, a much larger study involved 1,800 children and young adults from 14 nations. Although data collection ended in 2014, we are awaiting results, final results still seven years later. It makes one wonder whether conflicts of interest among these investigators may be contributing to this delay. We have known for several decades that microwave radiation affects the thyroid gland. Like many nations, the US has seen a doubling of thyroid cancer incidence in recent years. Although this could be due to better screening, a recent case control study suggests that cell phone radiation is contributing to this increase. A study conducted at the Yale School of Medicine found elevated thyroid cancer risk among heavier long-term cell phone users. The risk estimates from this small study were of borderline significance. A follow-up study, however, found that when some genetic variants were present, heavy cell phone use was significantly associated with thyroid cancer. The association increased when duration and frequency of cell phone use increased. 
the authors concluded that genetic susceptibility may increase the association between cell phone use and thyroid cancer. So there may be individual differences in susceptibility to thyroid cancer from cell phone use. Research on humans suggests the following additional health risks from cell phone use. Increased tumor risk in other anatomic sites, including this parotid or salivary gland and pituitary gland, and also some evidence in the female breast, particularly from women who keep the cell phone in their bra, sperm damage and reduced male fertility in males, particularly who keep the phone in their pocket, front pockets, increased incidence of miscarriage and preterm births, and increased incidence of headaches, hearing problems, impaired memory and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, from prenatal and early childhood exposures to cell phone radiation. It is estimated that at least two to 5% of the population suffer from electrohypersensitivity or EHS, an environmental intolerance which may result in headaches, memory impairment, fatigue, insomnia, tinnitus or ringing of the ears, heart palpitations, and other symptoms. EHS is controversial due to the difficulty in diagnosing this syndrome. Numerous sham provocation studies have been conducted to demonstrate that people with EHS can't tell when they are exposed to radiofrequency radiation. These results have been used to argue that EHS is a nocebo effect or psychosomatic. However, this methodology seems completely unsuitable to study EHS because it assumes that individuals should be immediately aware of the exposure. Like many other allergic responses to environmental pollutants, there is often a lag between exposures and symptoms. According to Physicians Weekly, EHS is, quote, a clinical syndrome characterized by the presence of a wide spectrum of nonspecific multiple organ symptoms, typically including central nervous system symptoms that occur following the patient's acute or chronic exposure to electromagnetic fields in the environment or in occupational settings. They go on to say, many hypersensitive patients appear to have impaired detoxification systems that become overloaded by excessive oxidative stress. Physicians Weekly reaches several hundred thousand physicians within the US. EHS has been observed in people working with radio electricity since the 1930s and with military radar in the 1940s. It first appeared in the general population in the 1970s. A 2014 review paper found considerable overlap in symptoms reported by patients with EHS with symptoms of demyelination. EHS may be at least partially caused by demyelination. According to one case report, a cell tower worker exposed to a high dose of microwave radiation from a cell tower later develops symptoms consistent with multiple sclerosis. Looking across different types of studies, adverse effects are observed on glial, and, glial cells and Schwann cells. In the NTP and Ramazzini animal studies, increased tumor incidence was found in both cell types from cell phone radiation. In case control studies, Increased tumor incidence was found among heavy cell phone users in glial cells, that is glioma, and Schwann cells, that is acoustic neuroma, also called vestibular schwannoma. Both types of cells are proximal to nerve, nerve fibers and both create myelin, a fatty sheath that insulates nerves. Finally, a few biophysicists have hypothesized that insulated nerves may behave like micro antennas, which could concentrate micro. Radi microwave radiation within certain tissues and organisms. Although many biologic studies have reported adverse effects from exposure to microwave radiation at intensities comparable to what one might get from a cell tower, few human cell tower studies have been conducted. A 2010 review by Karana summarized 10 studies with evidence of health effects. Six found evidence of increased neurobehavioral symptoms in people who resided within 500 meters of the cell tower, uh, symptoms that corresponded to those that when people report with electrohypersensitivity. 
two studies reported increased cancer incidence, and there's been one or two more studies reporting increased cancer incidence since this review has been published. Children are likely at greatest risk for neurobehavioral problems uh, from cell towers. Since 2015, seven studies have reported neurobehavioral effects in children exposed to greater cell tower radiation. The California Department of Public Health study found that when a cell phone had weak reception from a cell tower, the exposure from the phone was up to 10,000 times greater than when it had strong reception. The paper focused on the practical implications of these results for cell phone users. Namely, avoid using your cell phone when reception is weak, that is one or two bars. The re results were applied to the cell phone safety warnings that the state issued in 2017. The study is important also because it demonstrates the interdependent nature of cell phones and cell towers. The results have implications for epidemiologic studies, whether one is studying the effects of either cell phones or cell towers. Unless one takes both sorts of radiation into account, one will likely uh, underestimate the health effects of cell phone radiation or cell tower radiation. In 2015, the International EMF Scientist Appeal was submitted to the WHO. It was signed by almost 200 scientists. All had published peer-reviewed research on EMF and biology or health. The petition summarizes the scientific basis for the appeal, calls for stronger exposure limits, and makes policy recommendations. Currently, more than 240 EMF scientists in 44 nations have signed the petition. We have published over 2,000 papers on EMF in professional journals. The WHO is yet to respond to this petition. I recommend you check out the appeals website, emfscientist.org. The petition states, quote, numerous recent scientific publications have shown that EMF affects living organisms at levels well below international and national guidelines. Effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damage, structural and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory de deficits, neurological disorders, and negative impacts on general well being in humans. Damage goes well beyond the human race as there is growing evidence of harmful effects to both plant and animal life. The 5G appeal, which calls for a moratorium on the rollout of 5G, has been signed by more than 400 scientists and medical doctors in over 40 nations. Why are many scientists and physicians concerned about the recent deployment of 5G, the fifth generation of cellular technology? 5G cell phones and cell towers employ lower and higher frequency microwaves than used previously. This is a point that often gets ignored. It uses low band and mid band microwaves. Also for the first time, this technology employs millimeter waves, which are very high frequency microwaves. Millimeter waves behave differently than microwaves. Although they can move large amounts of data at high rates with short lags between transmissions, they travel by line of sight and the signals are blocked by building materials and foliage. Thus the telecom industry must install hundreds of thousands, actually worldwide millions of small cell towers to deploy this technology. The antennas can be as small as a few millimeters and the antenna arrays may consist of hundred antenna, hundreds of antenna elements. These massive multiple input, multiple output antennas allow the use of narrow beams that can track or target 5G cell phone users called beamforming. Millimeter wave radiation is largely absorbed in the skin, 
the sweat glands, the peripheral nerves, the eyes, and the testes. These waves can induce or inhibit cell death, enhance or suppress cell proliferation, inhibit cell cycle progression, and may alter structural and functional properties of membranes. The radiation can cause hypersensitivity and biochemical alterations in the immune and circulatory systems, the heart, the liver, the brain, and kidneys. These are secondary effects because most of the radiation is absorbed within a few millimeters of the skin. It can harm insects and promote growth of drug-resistant pathogens. Although there are hundreds of millimeter wave studies, no peer-reviewed studies have been published on the effects of exposure to 5G radiation. I'll repeat that. No peer-reviewed studies have been published on the effects of exposure to 5G radiation. Furthermore, due to the paucity of research funding in the US and also throughout the world, there are only about a dozen short-term effect studies for 4G, a technology that has been in use for a decade. As Senator Blumenthal charged in a US Senate hearing two years ago, we are flying blind, quote unquote, regarding the safety of this technology. This year, the journal Reviews on Environmental Health published a 150 page monograph in three parts, which examines the effects of non ionizing EMF, including wireless radiation on flora and fauna. These papers cite more than 1,200 references. The authors, Blake Levitt, Henry Lai, and Al Manville, concluded that current levels of EMF exposure have deleterious effects on many species of wildlife and plant life. Media coverage plays a large role in widespread ignorance and skepticism about the harmfulness of wireless radiation. Although media bias is a complex issue, it is important to understand because it shapes public opinion. Having studied media coverage of, wire, in, of wireless radiation research since 2019 or 2009, and interacted with many, many uh, reporters and journalists, in my opinion, the mainstream media have failed to report many important developments. We have evidence that the telecom industry has been wargaming the science and has captured key health and regulatory agencies in the US and other countries. Essentially, they've been using the tobacco industry playbook for decades now. When the media report the research, they usually promote the government narrative which dismisses or downplays the health risks, as the government also has a vested interest in seeing this technology proliferate. The media have potential conflicts of interest due to telecom industry advertising, which will amount to about $18.7 billion worldwide this year. Furthermore, several major news sources, including the New York Times and Washington Post, have established partnerships with industry to become early adopters of 5G. For safety tips on how to reduce exposure to wireless radiation, see my website, saferemr.com, which includes a link to the cell phone safety guidance published by the California Department of Public Health in 2017 after being suppressed for eight years. It also includes links to other uh, safety tip sources. To reduce the risk of harm, individuals should adopt the following behaviors. First, Minimize your use of cell phones and cordless phones. Use a landline whenever possible. Second, distance is your friend. Keeping your phone 10 inches from your body as compared to a 10th of an inch results in a 10,000 fold reduction in exposure. So keep your phone away from your head and body. Store your phone in a purse or backpack and text or use a wired headset or speaker phone for calls. Third, Cell phones are programmed to increase radiation when reception is poor. Thus, use your phone only when the signal is strong. For example, avoid using it in an elevator or in a vehicle as metal structures interfere with the signal. Finally, turn off wireless devices at bedtime, including your Wi-Fi router. Better yet, use wired connections, not Wi-Fi. Cable or optical fiber are faster, more secure, and safer than 4G or 5G or 2G or 3G. 
In conclusion, I believe that we are guinea pigs in a massive technological experiment that threatens our health. Our government must fund the research needed to determine a safe level of wireless radiation exposure and strengthen the FCC's radio frequency exposure limits. In the meantime, the government should impose a moratorium on technologies that increase our wireless radiation exposure, especially to new forms of wireless radiation like 5G. Um, here are some links to key resources and references. Uh, see my website in a day or two for a link to the recording of this webinar and to my slides. I imagine Michelle will be sending out a follow-up link as well. Here's my contact information. And um, I'm done. And interestingly, this uh, cartoon, I think I found it about 10 years ago, and it predicts a pandemic coming. Questions? Do we have time? Yes, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. We do have quite a lot of participants on today's webinar, so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Um, so with that, if you could please enter your questions into the online Q&A, um, that'll help us kind of keep track of all of the questions that are coming in. Um, all right, so first, well, I guess we'll just jump right in. And one of the first questions, and what evidence do you have that the study for brain tumors has been reproducible and where study biases are normalized? Uh, there are at least three uh, well done sets of studies that show uh, increased brain tumor risk. Uh, these were case control studies for uh, long-term heavy cell phone users. Our meta-analysis, we had eight studies with long-term and heavy, uh, heavier patterns of cell phone use. Uh, and uh, based on the meta-analytic meta statistics, we, that's where we found 60% increased risk. Some of these studies found much higher risk, uh, but we're talking about a number of different countries. So the exposures may have been very different from the cell phones. And also the proximity of the cell tower to the cell phone, which wasn't taken into account in these studies, uh, may have obscured the effect in some of these studies and may have increased the effect in other studies because the cell phones were forced to work much harder. So um, there, there is substantial evidence in case control research, particularly. There's a little bit of evidence, but it's more, less consistent from cohort studies because they haven't done a very good job of exposure assessment. And the uh, industry funded scientists like to quote some large scale uh, cohort studies, but the design of those studies was really not set up to do a good exposure assessment. So those studies were confounded and worthless in my opinion and the opinion of many scientists that the industry funded scientists like to cite as evidence of no effect. Thank you. Um, and again, a reminder, if you're putting your questions in the chat, um, chances are I'm probably not going to get to it. We have a very, very long open Q&A box questions. Um, so if you could please put your questions in the Q&A function instead of the chat, that'll just help us kind of keep track of all of the questions coming in. Um, as of right now, we have 47 plus open. Um, so we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Um, I apologize in advance if we don't get to all of the questions today, but we'll do what we can. Uh -huh. Another question, why did NTP studies not show a progressive increase in tumors with increasing exposure? Um, this is the hallmark of providing harm causation in toxicology. Uh, most of the scientists, and I've talked to many of the EMF scientists, argue that the effects are nonlinear. So these, the, the linearity assumption really does not apply to EMF, as it does not apply to apparently many chemicals as well. Um, and I think that's, that's basically why we're, we're making the wrong assumptions to expect uh, linear or monotonic effects. Also, the, if, 
talking to these scientists who are some of the leading thinkers and contributors to the science, uh, they discuss frequency windows, certain frequencies. We may be more susceptible to certain frequencies in terms of the carrier waves. We also may be more susceptible uh, to pulsed and modulated uh, frequencies, which are used in cell phone radiation, uh, as opposed to continuous wave frequencies, which some of these studies employ in the laboratory using signal generators. However, there is also evidence that continuous waves at certain frequencies are harmful, but it does seem that they're more likely to find biologic effects with pulsed or modulated waves, such as used in cell phone or Wi-Fi radiation. Thank you. Another question, is exposure to Bluetooth and other types of wireless technology comparable to cell phone risks? Uh, there's not really much research on Bluetooth. I think I've only found two studies uh, looking at the effects on hearing and they didn't find anything. Uh, my concern with Bluetooth, and I have a post on the AirPods uh, in response to a reporter who had asked me about this years ago, is that there may be, with these low intensity exposures, there may be opening of the blood brain barrier, enabling uh, chemical toxins within your circulatory system to penetrate your brain tissue at times. The other concern with a device like the AirPods is they're using a technology called near field magnetic induction. And we know that magnetic fields there's a potential uh, for cancer risk with those as well. And there's been no studies I could find of the health effects of near field magnetic induction. So it's much preferable to use a wired headset than a wireless headset. Thank you. And I actually saw that question a couple more times down lower in the Q&A box. Um, and, and as uh, Dr. Moskowitz mentioned, um, he does have some more information about earbuds on his website as well. Um, our next question, um, can you reiterate why to avoid using your phone in low service areas and what the low service area has to do with it? Well, the phones are programmed to put out more radiation to make a solid connection with the cell tower. So if you're in a low service area, your phone can put out according to the California Department of Public Health study, uh, up to 10,000 times greater exposure to you as the user if the signal strength is weak, because just that's how the phones are designed. So when you have a good signal, uh, the phone is programmed to put out less radiation. And if you keep the phone near your body or near your head, you're gonna be exposed to a lot of that radiation. So you should definitely avoid using the phone when the signal strength is, is weak. Um, and there was another question kind of tied to that in that, is there a way to be able to tell where the antennas are in your cell phones? Uh, there is an FCC website. It's made extremely difficult to navigate, but all the technical documents pertaining to your cell phone um, are available and can be downloaded from the FCC website. Uh, a Chicago Tribune investigator who spent a year on this issue, I had to go over how to download this information several times with him before he could figure it out himself and to be able to do it himself. So I can't explain how to do it here. Uh, it is rather complicated and I think it's made purposely so because the FCC does not want the user to see this information. The FCC also has a requirement that uh, the cell phone manufacturers are supposed to inform the user to, uh, to not use the phone closer to their body than how the cell phone was tested in the body test. It's usually somewhere between a quarter inch and, a half, and an inch from the body. Uh, but the, manu the FCC has never enforced this regulation and uh, requiring the, the manufacturer to tell the, the cell phone user. So the cell phone, use the cell phone companies have basically buried this information in their manuals or you have to download it online to find out what the distance was that the phone was tested when it was certified, the distance from the body. This became the basis for a law that the city of Berkeley passed several years ago. Uh, originally, it was, it was adopted by the city of San Francisco, but in both cases, the CTIA sued these cities and eventually forced them to back down, threatening uh, to collect punitive and 
uh, attorney fees. So uh, they intimidated uh, both of these cities to, to back down on this. Uh, one of our strongest supporters was the mayor of San Francisco at the time when the San Francisco ordinance was passed, Gavin Newsom, he's now the governor of the state of California. Uh, but he he's, says in a, in a film that uh, we made years ago, a documentary, that he's never seen such blowback from an industry over, over anything, uh, let alone a, a simple law requiring notifying consumers in the cell phone stores that the cell phones have a minimum distance requirement. Thank you for sharing. Another question, um, can you talk, speak to the 2021 WHO comments on the EMF study database, where the WHO stated that scientific knowledge in this area is now more extensive than for most chemicals, and the current evidence does not confirm the existence of any health consequences from exposure to EMF at or below current international exposure guidelines? This was the, the WHO website? Um, yes, the 2021 WHO comments on the EMF study database. Well, the problem we have with the, the WHO, and I can't go into the history of this, is basically the EMF project in the WHO was industry funded originally, and it's been co-opted by industry. Uh, and the WHO actually, uh, the head of the, the original WHO EMF project created the ICNIRP to create the guidelines, which then the WHO promotes. I go into this in a fair amount of detail on my website. Uh, Microwave News also covers it in real time, what happened. You can go back through their archive and see how the WHO got co-opted by industry and basically presents uh, exposure limits uh, and promotes exposure limits that, that uh, industry-funded scientists uh, disseminated. And the members of ICNARP, there's an interesting series of investigative articles by a group of European journalists uh, uh, that look into uh, the conflicts of interest among the members of ICNARP and how this self-serving, self-selected group has functioned to co-op many of the health agencies throughout Europe and in other countries around the world. Our FDA apparently has either operating out of ignorance or has been co-opted also by this industry. And the FCC has no health expertise and is supposed to rely on the FDA, but the FDA has been pretty much worthless in providing sound advice to the FCC. The EPA was doing cutting edge research in the 1990s, uh, but then the Congress cut it off and hasn't done any since. The EPA actually back in the 70s was doing environmental monitoring of RF exposure, radio frequency exposure, but that uh, ended shortly thereafter. So basically, uh, most countries, the governments do not want to know what the risks are and are doing all they can to basically uh, manufacture doubt that there is a risk. The CDC, by the way, years ago, tried to um, put on its website recommendations to take precaution because they were concerned about risks, particularly to children. Uh, within a matter of weeks, it was pulled down due to political influence from the industry funded scientists. And that, that was eventually written up by the New York Times and also by Microwave News, that, that little incident. But Christopher Portier was, who was at the CDC and initiated that effort uh, was actually one of the experts that the IARC had called upon in 2011 to review the carcinogenicity. But the politics dominated and uh, the CDC pulled, pulled back the changes to its website. So it's basically a case of the blind leading the blinded. Thank you so much for sharing all of that context for us as well. Um, no, some more questions. Does cell phone use only mean talking on the phone or does it also include using apps, texting, surfing the web on your phone? All of that can use cellular technology. It can also, if you have a Wi-Fi connection, can use Wi-Fi. Um, 
and in some instances you may receive less exposure from the Wi-Fi. But these apps also are constantly updating and exposing you to more and more radiation than the original cell phone, which just had a singular function, which was to allow you to make calls. So this, the smartphone in many ways is exposing users to probably a lot more radiation than the original, many of the original phones, especially after the, the very early, early phones. Thank you. Um, can you please talk about schools and children and exposures in the classroom? There's been some research on Wi-Fi in schools, Wi-Fi and health effects. I have a post uh, summarizing much of the recent research on Wi-Fi health effects. Uh, the effects of Wi-Fi seem similar to cell phone radiation, mostly neurobehavioral effects. Um, we just don't know a whole lot about the exposures in schools. Some schools now are moving to wiring classrooms and engaging, adopting safer practices like turning off the Wi-Fi when it's not in use to try to protect the students and the staff from exposures. Increasingly, we're hearing from teachers who are developing hypersensitivity and having problems uh, continuing their occupation as a result of this these exposures. Uh, initially, Los Angeles Unified School District was recognizing this problem and providing accommodations to teachers by moving them to buildings that had not yet adopted Wi-Fi. But I don't know if there are any school buildings without Wi-Fi at this point. So uh, these teachers may have had to give up their profession entirely. Um, can you also describe the difference between EMF and RFR? EMF, electromagnetic fields, includes radio frequency radiation. Uh, I addressed this early on the, with the EMF spectrum. It ranges from these extremely low frequency fields, um, particularly magnetic fields, which have been found to be possibly carcinogenic. And, there's a fair amount of evidence since that declaration was made by the IARC. Uh, to intermediate frequency fields, to radio frequency fields moving up the spectrum. Uh, and the radio frequency fields include the microwaves and includes the millimeter waves. And then beyond that, we have uh, light, ultraviolet. Uh, we have heating, light, ultraviolet, uh, and then uh, ionizing radiation begins in the higher frequency ultraviolet, uh, including X-rays, cosmic rays, and so forth. So it's just one portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Although the physicists like to make the distinction, well, it's not ionizing, but even, which is true, but even non-ionizing radiation, we have substantial evidence that has lots of harmful effects through indirect uh, causes because our bodies are basically electric and operate, many of our cells operate on electricity, small pulses. So uh, we are basically electrical beings and we are sensitive particularly to artificial forms of EMF, uh, which we were not exposed to during evolution. Thank you. And again, thank you everyone for all of these questions. We, we still have plenty, plenty of questions. Um, I, do, I do recognize we're hitting the, the hour mark. Um, Dr. Moskowitz has kindly agreed to stay on for a little longer to do some extended Q&A. Um, but for those of you who, who need to log off, we, we recognize that we've used up our hour. Um, we are gonna be sticking around to answer some more questions. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll just keep on rolling. And, and as a reminder, yes, this presentation has been recorded. Um, those who logged into Zoom today will get a, an email from us tomorrow directly from Zoom um, that will have a link to the recording. So you guys will be able to reference that at a, at a later time. Um, all right, we'll keep digging into to many of these questions. Thank you everyone for all the questions. I'm, I'm doing my best here to keep track of everything coming through. <laughs> Um, and some of the things we've already answered. Okay. 
ah, would it be possible to get a, um, a link or to get links or information about all of the different studies that you've re referenced, maybe the contact information for the authors or links to, to, the, um, to the different studies as available? Well, I'll be posting my slides within the next day or two, and there's lots of links in the slides. Uh, also, if you go to my website, saferemr.com, there's a table of contents which has links to the key posts on uh, that site. Thank you so much. Another question, um, what scientific field would you say is, is ideal to help research this topic? Um, someone notes that their campus has a lot of different cellular bases and is just curious what, what professional categories you tend to see researchers in this topic come from. They come from a whole host of um, biologic, biochemical, uh, engineering backgrounds. Uh, this is really a multi or transdisciplinary topic to do good research. You have to basically have teams of researchers that specialize in uh, various systems of the body and, and also have a great deal of knowledge about uh, the nature of electromagnetic fields and how they're transmitted and the interaction between the, these fields and the body. So um, there's no one particular field that dominates. Uh, there's a fair amount of epidemiologists who've looked at the research from the standpoint of case control studies and cohort studies as well. So there's a role for a variety of different disciplines uh, for those who would like to study this. The problem we face though is there's no funding. Uh, and I thought it was just particularly a problem in the US, but my European colleagues say that unless you willing to sell out to industry, you basically are, have very limited funding opportunities. And so we need to create either a pool of funding to create uh, opportunities for researchers in this field. Most, most of the real experts who've made the major contributions are, are now retired or facing retirement. We need fresh blood. But in order to get that, we have to have research funding in order to build a, a research community. Uh, perhaps a good model is the tobacco-related disease research program in California, which was funded by a voters proposition initiative, voters initiative, Proposition 99, back in the 90s, and created funds for research, for education, for training regarding tobacco-related disease. Uh, and the program Smartly, the, the people who wrote the initiative had the program managed by a university, not by the state of California, which uh, co-opted its own investigators who looked into this uh, issue uh, and prevented them from, from disseminating what they learned for eight years. So the tobacco-related disease research program might be a good model, uh, along with Proposition 99, for establishing a research fund to build a cadre of researchers who can really look into the uh, biologic and health effects and come up with uh, sound guidelines for uh, exposure limits. Thank you so much. And um, what would you say to people who state the jury is still out on health effects? I think they need to, um, read the literature carefully and not be so uh, skeptical and critical. There's just too much. I, I, I interviewed a person at, this was five years ago and the situation probably hasn't improved great, greatly. The person at the FDA who's supposedly their most knowledgeable person about radio frequency radiation effects. Uh, and he was completely ignorant of the science or what, how to do science. His background, he had an undergraduate degree in nuclear engineering, as it turned out, which I only learned later. But he was represented to me as being their most knowledgeable person. Uh, this is, it was just abysmal. We ended up debating each other basically for two hours because he didn't really understand research. He basically said, well, every study that has ever found a, a biologic effect had some flaw and could be ignored, therefore. 
but that's not how research works. Every study has a flaw. I've never found one in 40 years that didn't have some limitation, either internal and in terms of internal or external validity, generalizability. Uh, that's, but those opponents uh, of this research typically pull apart these studies and find one flaw. They didn't measure the heating in a case using a real cell phone, for example. A classic study published in JAMA, he, he criticized that senior author was the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. It was published in JAMA. He said, well, she didn't measure heating from these cell phones that she tested and deep did the PET scans. Therefore, we could ignore the study, even though it showed increased glucose metabolism in the brain from a 50 minute exposure to a cell phone. I was just absurd trying to debate this with him. Um, many of these scientists are knowledgeable, but I think their a priori beliefs are too strong for them to accept the preponderance of the evidence that's been published in the peer reviewed literature. I don't know what you do with people like that. Thank you so much. And again, thank you everyone for all of the questions. Um, I know I'm getting some questions about, you've just missed my question. Um, my apologies, I'm, I, we've had over a hundred, actually we've had almost 150. So I'm doing my best to, to keep track of what questions are coming in, things we've already spoken to, um, et cetera. So my apologies if, if I've missed your question. Um, we, we do have quite a lot of questions coming in. We've had quite a lot of attendees today and I'm doing my best here. So thank you for, for hanging in there with me. Um, all right, our next question that we're going to go to here today. Um, does it help to reduce radiation exposure to turn cell phones in airplane mode when Wi-Fi is available? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Uh, yeah, the chat popped up on my screen, distracted me. <laughs> um, yes, does it help to reduce radiation exposure to turn cell phones in airplane mode when Wi-Fi is available? Uh, definitely should decrease your exposure considerably. Better yet, turn off Wi-Fi. Uh, and also, if you're using your cellular, you should be turning off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth if you're not using them to reduce some of your exposure. You're also wasting battery by having all three operating simultaneously. Thank you so much. Um, have you seen any um, research or studies on pregnancy? Uh, I have a, actually a couple pages on pregnancy. Um, and I think I, I mentioned that there's evidence of increased risk of um, miscarriage, preterm birth from uh, exposures during pregnancy, uh, mostly animal model research. Uh, there was a study that just was published in the last few days with mice showing, I think, that vitamin C antioxidants seem to block the effects on female mice. Uh, so there's a fair amount of studies suggesting that antioxidants are a good way to protect yourself. So have a good diet with lots of antioxidants if you want to protect yourself from these exposures, as well as try the best you can to reduce your exposures is the best advice we can give at this time. Uh, people basically need to organize and um, take collective action in order to get government to pay attention to this issue and protect us from this environmental pollutant. Thank you. Um, and is there any estimate about what percentage of the population experiences electromagnetic hypersensitivity or you know, any estimation around the, how many people might be experiencing such a condition? The estimates from the various studies are all over the place. There was, a, they range from a few percent with severe symptoms in a recent study in, I forget which country now, I think it was 2% uh, to around five or so percent with severe symptoms. A study, a population-based survey in California found 3%, this was quite a few years ago though, reported having symptoms. Uh, problem with these studies is self-reports may be right, they may be wrong. Okay, so you may be underestimating because a lot of people are unaware that this is causing their symptoms and you may be overestimating in some cases because their symptoms are being caused by some other toxin. 
in talking to clinicians who uh, diagnose and treat this, uh, a lot of the people with electro hypersensitivity uh, eventually may develop multiple chemical sensitivity and vice versa. People with multiple chemical sensitivity seem to be more likely to develop electro hypersensitivity. Uh, I've seen estimates as high as 13% in Taiwan in a self-reported survey, but then several years later, just asking the questions in a different manner, uh, only 5% reported hypersensitivity. So there's no standardization. It's really hard to say how many people are actually suffering. And in our recent paper, and there were some like 30 co-authors, uh, we're laying out a plan for developing better criteria for diagnosis using biomarkers. Thank you. Um, has there been any research done to look at adjusting the wave transmission wavelength and power um, on, on cell phones to get a similar result without any tied to biological effects? Could you repeat that question? I'm not sure. sure. If there's been any research done to look, adjusting the wave transmission wavelength and power of cell phones to achieve similar results without biological effects. Oh, um, actually, I'm, I'm not aware if there has been any research trying to make the phone safer in terms of using different uh, frequencies or modulations of pulsing. Um, perhaps in a review of the biologic studies, you might be able to make some inferences, which could lead to testing out different strategies. But there, there may indeed be safer carrier frequencies and safer ways to modulate without pulsing perhaps the, uh, the frequencies to reduce the biologic activity and the harmful effects. And, and as I was saying earlier, there may be frequency windows that are, we're much more sensitive to uh, it also interacts with the, the intensity of the exposure because some of these exposures are more reactive when they're lower intensity than when they're more moderate intensity. For example, the blood brain barrier phenomena occurs at very low intensity exposures to microwaves and very high intensity, but seems to be a uh, disappear with more moderate intensities. Uh, so our, our systems may, may be adaptive to protecting us through the middle range of these intensity exposures. Thank you. Um, all right. We also have another question. Um, do you, are you, can you share any information you have around, about any organizations or others involved in the space where people might be able to solicit more information and get involved? Uh, I have a slide. Um, Environmental Health Trust, Physicians for Safe Technology, Americans for Responsible Technology are groups that have been quite active in disseminating information. Environmental Health Trust actually sued the FCC and won the case. And we'll see if the FCC does what the courts say or just basically um, ignore the research once again and, and reaffirm them the obsolete exposure limits. Uh, those are the primary national groups um, that I'm aware of. There's a lot of international groups as well. If you go on Facebook, I'm sure you can find a lot of groups. There's a lot of local groups. Americans for Responsible Technology has a list of, uh, I think it's well over 100 now, local groups fighting cell towers in their communities. This is an ongoing struggle and the, decks, the deck is stacked against local communities because basically the Congress gave the FCC preemptory powers over the uh, deployment of cell towers. So as long as the cell towers are compliant with the FCC exposure limits, uh, the communities have no basis according to the courts to argue on health or environmental grounds. So they have to fight the cell towers basically on uh, other grounds such as the aesthetics or property, property values or things like that. Um, so it makes it really tough for members of city government 
city councils, board of supervisors to respond to citizens' concerns um, because they have a very hard time fighting the industry and the industry often sues if it loses a political battle and uh, the courts often respect the uh, FCC section 704 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which gives the FCC the authority over localities and states. So it's really an uphill battle fighting this industry and the courts have not been very helpful for the most part in respecting uh, public health and citizens' concerns. Well, thank you so, so much for your time today, Dr. Moskowitz. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I appreciate everyone else who joined us as well, who, who've been asking questions in the chat and the Q&A. Um, really appreciate everyone being here and joining us. Um, this presentation has been recorded and will be made available on our YouTube page. Um, and we'll be sending out a link to the YouTube page and also to um, the presentation on our, on our website as well. Um, and Dr. Moskowitz has kindly said he will make his presentation available. So we'll be sure to share that um, with, with the recording as well. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for this presentation, Dr. Moskowitz and, and your research. Um, and, and we appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Michelle. And I will post my slides on my, my homepage of my website within a day or two, as, as well as a link to the uh, video recording. Thank you so much. And we'll thank also, you all for um, coming. We'll also be updating our um, website as well with a link to everything. And you can find uh, Dr. Moskowitz's website and his bio on our website to see where you guys registered for the webinar today. All right, well, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day.